Chapter 14 Sashenka and Nadenka There walked into the room a very young man, of about nineteen, perhaps even less, to judge from the youthfulness of his handsome, self-confident, upturned face. He was fairly well dressed, or at any rate his clothes looked well on him. In height he was a little above the average. The black hair that hung in thick locks about his head, and the big, bold, dark eyes were particularly conspicuous in his face. Except that his nose was rather broad and turned up, he was a handsome fellow. He walked in solemnly. I believe I have the opportunity of conversing with Monsieur Trusotsky, he pronounced in a measured tone, emphasizing with peculiar relish the word opportunity, giving him to understand thereby that he did not consider it either an honor or a pleasure to converse with Monsieur Trusotsky. Velchaninov began to grasp the position. Something seemed to be dawning on Pavel Pavlovich, too. There was a look of uneasiness in his face, but he stood his ground. "'Not having the honor of your acquaintance,' he answered majestically, "'I imagine that you cannot have business of any sort with me. "'You had better hear me first and then give your opinion.' The young man admonished him self-confidently, and, taking out a tortoise-shell lorgnette hanging on a cord, he examined through it the bottle of champagne standing on the table. When he had calmly completed his scrutiny of the bottle, he folded up the lorgnette and turned to Pavel Pavlovich again. "'Alexander Lobov!' "'What do you mean by Alexander Lobov?' That's me. Haven't you heard of me? No. How should you, though? I've come on important business that chiefly concerns you. Allow me to sit down. I'm tired. Sit down? Velchaninov urged him. But the young man succeeded in sitting down before being invited to do so. In spite of the increasing pain in his chest, Velchaninov was interested in this impudent youth. In his pretty, childlike, and rosy face, he fancied a remote resemblance to Nadia. "'You sit down, too,' the lad suggested to Pavel Pavlovich, motioning him with a careless nod of the head to a seat opposite. "'Don't trouble. I'll stand.' You'll be tired. You needn't go away, Monsieur Velchaninov, if you like to stay. I've nowhere to go. I'm at home. As you please. I must confess I should prefer you to be present while I have an explanation with this gentleman. Nadezhda Fedosievna gave me rather a flattering account of you. Bah! When is he time to do that? Why, just now, after you left. I've just come from there, too. I've something to tell you, Monsieur Trusotsky. He turned round to Pavel Pavlovich, who was standing. We, that is, Nadezhda Fedosievna and I, he went on, letting his words drop one by one as he lolled carelessly in the armchair. We've cared for each other for ever so long, and have given each other our promise. You are in our way now. I've come to suggest that you should clear out. Will it suit you to act on my suggestion? Pavel Pavlovich positively reeled. He turned pale, but a diabolical smile came on to his lips at once. No, it won't suit me at all. He rapped out laconically. "'You don't say so,' 
The young man turned round in the armchair and crossed one leg over the other. "'I don't know who it is I'm speaking to,' added Pavel Pavlovich. "'I believe, indeed, that there's no object in continuing our conversation.' Uttering this, he too thought fit to sit down. "'I told you you would be tired,' the youth observed casually. "'I told you just now that my name is Alexander Lobov, and that Nadezhda and I are pledged to one another. Consequently, you can't say, as you did just now, that you don't know who it is you have to deal with. You can't imagine either that I have nothing more to say to you. Putting myself aside, it concerns Nadezhda Fedosievna, whom you persist in pestering so insolently. And that alone is sufficient reason for an explanation. All this he let drop, word by word, through his closed lips, with the air of a coxcomb who did not deign to articulate his words. He even drew out his lorgnette again and turned it upon something while he was talking. "'Excuse me, young man!' Pavel Pavlovich exclaimed irritably. But the young man instantly snubbed him. At any other time I should certainly forbid your calling me young man, but now you will admit that my youth is my chief advantage over you, and that you would have been jolly glad this morning, for instance, when you presented your bracelet, to be a tiny bit younger. Ah, oh, you sprat, murmured Velchaninov. In any case, sir... Pavel Pavlovich corrected himself with dignity. I do not consider the reasons you have advanced, most unseemly and dubious reasons, sufficient to continue discussing them. I see that this is all a foolish and childish business. Tomorrow I'll make inquiries of my highly respected friend, Fedose Semyonovitch, and now I beg you to retire. "'Do you see the sort of man he is?' the youth cried at once, unable to sustain his previous tone, and turning hotly to Velchaninov. "'It's not enough for him that they've put out their tongues at him today and kicked him out. He'll go tomorrow to tell tales of us to the old man. Won't you prove by that, you obstinate man, that you want to take the girl by force?' that you want to buy her of people in their dotage who in our barbarous state of society retain authority over her? I should have thought it would have been enough for you that she's shown you how she despises you. Why, she gave you back your indecent present today, your bracelet. What more do you want? No one has returned me a bracelet, and it's utterly out of the question. Pavel Pavlovich said, startled. "'Out of the question? Do you mean to say Monsieur Velchaninov has not given it you?' "'Damnation take you,' thought Velchaninov. "'Nadyezhda Ferosievna did commission me,' he said, frowning, "'to give you this case, Pavel Pavlovich.' I refused to take it, but she begged me. Here it is. I'm annoyed. He took out the case, and, much embarrassed, laid it before Pavel Pavlovich, who was struck dumb. Why didn't you give it to him before? said the young gentleman, addressing Velchaninov severely. "'As you see, I hadn't managed to do so yet,' the latter replied, frowning. "'That's queer.' "'What?' "'You must admit it's queer anyway, though I am ready to allow there may be a misunderstanding.' Velchaninov felt a great inclination to get up at once and pull the saucy urchin's ears but he could not refrain from bursting out laughing in his face. The boy promptly laughed, too. 
It was very different with Pavel Pavlovich. If Volchaninov could have observed the terrible look he turned upon him when Volchaninov was laughing at Lobov, he would have realized that at that instant the man was passing through a momentous crisis. But though Volchaninov did not see that glance, he felt that he must stand by Pavel Pavlovich. Listen, Monsieur Lobov, he began in a friendly tone. Without entering into discussion of other reasons upon which I don't care to touch, I would only point out to you that, in paying his addresses to Nadezhda Fedosievna, Pavel Pavlovich can, in any case, boast of certain qualifications. In the first place, the fact that everything about him is known to that estimable family. In the second place, his excellent and highly respectable position. Finally, his fortune. And consequently, he must naturally be surprised at the sight of a rival like you, a man perhaps of great merit, but so exceedingly young that he can hardly take you for a serious suitor. And so he is justified in asking you to retire. What do you mean by exceedingly young? I was nineteen last month. By law I could have been married long ago. That's all I can say. But what father could bring himself to give you his daughter now, even if you were to be a millionaire in the future or some benefactor of mankind? At nineteen a man cannot even answer for himself, and you are ready to take the responsibility of another person's future, that is, the future of another child like yourself? Why do you think it's quite honorable? I have ventured to speak frankly to you because you appealed to me just now as an intermediary between you and Pavel Pavlovich. Ah, to be sure, his name's Pavel Pavlovich, observed the boy. How was it I kept fancying that he was Vasily Petrovich? Well, he went on, addressing Velchaninov, you haven't surprised me in the least. I knew you were all like that. It's odd, though, that they talked of you as a man rather new in a way. But that's all nonsense, though. Far from there being anything dishonorable on my part, as you so freely expressed it, it's the very opposite, as I hope to make you see. To begin with, we've pledged our word to each other, and, what's more, I've promised her before two witnesses— that if she ever falls in love with someone else, or simply regrets having married me and wants to separate, I will at once give her a formal declaration of my infidelity, and so will support her petition for divorce. What's more, in case I should later on go back upon my word and refuse to give her that declaration, I will give her as security on our wedding day an I.O.U. for a hundred thousand roubles, so that if I should be perverse about the declaration, she can at once change my I.O.U. and me into the bargain. In that way everything will be secured, and I shouldn't be risking anybody's future. That's the first point. I bet that fellow... What's his name... Predposilov invented that for you, cried Velchaninov. <laughs> chuckled Pavel Pavlovich viciously. What's that gentleman sniggering about? You guessed right, it was Predposilov's idea, and you must admit it was a shrewd one. The absurd law is completely paralyzed by it. Of course I intend to love her forever, and she laughs tremendously. At the same time, it's ingenious, and you must admit that it's honorable, and that it's not every man who would consent to do it. To my thinking, it's far from being honorable. It's positively disgusting. The young man shrugged his shoulders. Again, you don't surprise me he observed after a brief silence. I have given up being surprised at that sort of thing long ago. 
Expert Posilov would tell you flatly that your lack of comprehension of the most natural things is due to the corruption of your most ordinary feelings and ideas by a long life spent idly and absurdly. But possibly we don't understand one another. They spoke well of you anyway. You're fifty, I suppose, aren't you? Kindly keep to the point. Excuse my indiscretion and don't be annoyed. I didn't mean anything. I will continue. I'm by no means a future millionaire, as you expressed it. And what an idea. I have nothing but what I stand up in, but I have complete confidence in my future. I shan't be a hero or benefactor of mankind either, but I shall keep myself and my wife. Of course I have nothing now. I was brought up in their house, you see, from childhood. How was that? Well, you see, I'm the son of a distant relation of Zalabinin's wife, and when all my people died and left me at eight years old, the old man took me in and afterwards sent me to the high school. He's really a good-natured man, if you care to know. I know that. Yes, a bit antiquated in his ideas, but kind-hearted. It's a long time now, of course, since I was under his guardianship. I want to earn my own living and to owe no one anything. How long have you been independent? Velchaninov inquired. Why, four months. Oh, well, one can understand it then. You've been friends from childhood. Well, you have a situation, then? Yes, a private situation in a notary's office for twenty-five roubles a month. Of course, only for the time, but when I made my offer I hadn't even that. I was serving on the railway, then, for ten roubles a month, but only for the time. Do you mean to say you've made an offer of marriage? Yes, a formal offer, and ever so long ago, over three weeks. Well, and what happened? The old man laughed awfully at first, and then was awfully angry, and locked her up upstairs. But Nadia held out heroically. But that was all because he was a bit crusty with me before, for throwing up the berth in his department which he had got me into four months ago, before I went to the railway. He's a capital old chap, I tell you again, simple and jolly at home, but you can't fancy what he's like as soon as he's in his office. He's like a Jove enthroned. I naturally let him know that I was not attracted by his manners there, but the chief trouble was through the head clerk's assistant. That gentleman took it into his head that I had been rude to him, and all that I said to him was that he was undeveloped. I threw them all up, and now I'm at a notary's. And did you get much in the department? Oh, I was not on the regular staff. The old man used to give me an allowance, too. I tell you, he's a good sort, but we shan't give in all the same. Of course, twenty-five roubles is not enough to support a wife, but I hope soon to have a share in the management of Count Zavaleski's neglected estates, and then to rise to three thousand straight off, or else I shall become a lawyer. People are always going to law nowadays. Bah! What a clap of thunder! There'll be a storm. It's a good thing I managed to get here before it. I came on foot. I ran almost all the way. But excuse me, if so, when did you manage to talk things over with Nadezhda Fedosievna, especially if they refuse you admittance? Why, one can talk over the fence. Did you notice that red-haired girl? He laughed. She's very active on our side, and Marie Nikitichna too. Da, she's a serpent, that Marie Nikitichna. Why do you wince? Are you afraid of the thunder? No, I'm unwell, very unwell. 
Velchaninov, in positive agony from the pain in his chest, got up and tried to walk about the room. "'Oh, then of course I'm in your way. Don't be uneasy, I'm just going.' And the youth jumped up from his seat. "'You're not in the way, it's no matter,' said Velchaninov courteously. "'How can it be no matter? When Kobilnikov had a stomach ache, "'Do you remember Shadrin? Are you fond of Shadrin?' "'Yes.' "'So am I. "'Well, Vasily, oh, hang it, Pavel Pavlovich, let's finish.' He turned, almost laughing, to Pavel Pavlovich. "'I will once more, for your comprehension, formulate the question. "'Do you consent to make a formal withdrawal of all pretensions "'in regard to Nadezhda Fedosievna to the old people to-morrow, in my presence?' "'I certainly do not.' Pavel Pavlovich, too, got up from his seat with an impatient and exasperated air. "'And I beg you once more to spare me, for all this is childish and silly.' "'You had better look out.' The youth held up a warning finger with a supercilious smile. "'Don't make a mistake in your calculations. Do you know what such a mistake leads to?' I warn you that in nine months' time, when you have had all your expense and trouble, and you come back here, you'll be forced to give up Nadezhda Fedosievna. Or if you don't give her up, it will be the worse for you. That's what will be the end of it. I must warn you that you're like the dog in the manger. Excuse me, it's only a comparison. Getting nothing yourself and preventing others. From motives of humanity, I tell you again— Reflect upon it. Force yourself for once in your life to reflect rationally. I beg you to spare me your sermonizing, cried Pavel Pavlovich furiously. And as for your nasty insinuations, I shall take measures tomorrow, severe measures. Nasty insinuations? What do you mean by that? "'You're nasty yourself, if that's what you've got in your head. "'However, I agree to wait till tomorrow. "'But if... "'Ah, oh, thunder again! "'Good-bye. Very glad to make your acquaintance.' "'He nodded to Velchaninov and ran off, "'apparently in haste to get back before the storm "'and not to get caught in the rain.' "'Breaking in. A quick word on the title of this chapter. Young Mr. Lobov's first name is Alexander. Sashenka is one of several diminutive forms of that name, just as Nadenka is one of several diminutives of the name Nadezhda. So the title is picking out these two young figures as lovebirds. The arrogant young radical had by this time become something of a trope in Russian literature, at least since Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. The writer Nikolai Shadrin, whom Lobov quotes towards the end of this chapter, was himself sensitive to left-wing social causes and would have been popular with the younger generation. End of Comments